that's our signal to get going. My thanks to Marshall Scatone for handling the class uh, last week. Um, talk about roles in the church. Um, in the book of Ephesians, um, five offices are listed in the church. The purpose of these offices to equip, to build up, to attain unity in the body, and to make the body immune to deceit. So that is the purpose of the structure that God has designed. We've talked before that uh, the first two in the list, apostles and prophets, these are speaking specifically of people inspired by the Holy Spirit, that these offices are no longer needed. Uh, their record of the Holy Spirit's words from the first century provide the one and only foundation necessary for the doctrine and instruction of the church today. But of course, the roles of evangelists, shepherds, and teachers will continue till the end of time. And so we'll uh, try to wrap up most of our discussion on elders today. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the work of an elder being a pattern of blueprint, tending to the needs of members, helping members develop their talents for service, helping members mature in the faith, protected from deceit, being willing to regularly examine himself for selfish attitudes, acting as God's agent and overseeing the people of the congregation, being hospitable and welcoming to strangers, praying for those who are ill, being an instructor of sound doctrine, being accountable for their brethren, and rebuking and silencing those who reject sound doctrine. So based on that summary of duties, we talked about uh, the... Uh, we're starting to talk about the qualifications of the people necessary to do this kind of work consistently and effectively. Uh, we talked last week also about the purpose of formal designation. Does someone need to be formally and publicly recognized as an elder before they can work as a shepherd in a congregation? And I answered, usually no, sometimes yes. Um, God gives men the freedom to act uh, as an elder, even if they're not formally recognized as an elder. All of those things on that list we saw before are in fact responsibilities of all Christians, not just elders or elder candidates. Uh, but the implication of this is that qualified men should be acting as elders before they're formally named as elders. And the second implication, selecting a man as an elder or any leadership position in the hope that he will be more motivated to behave like one is a mistake. Um, what are the benefits of being formally recognized? Whoops. Uh, it creates credibility with those who don't know him. You can imagine in the Church of Jerusalem that probably at one point was uh, uh, 10 or 12,000 strong. Uh, you, you couldn't know all the elders. And so uh, when they called a meeting of the elders, you, you needed to kind of know who those people were and whether the person addressing you had, had been recognized by part of the body as an elder. Um, and so, obviously, a smaller congregation doesn't have quite that challenge, but certainly in uh, representing itself to outsiders, and someone says, who is the leadership of the congregation, uh, formal recognition gives you the ability to say, yes, these people have been formally designated as the leadership of the congregation. We talked about elder qualifications, character, leadership, family reputation, family experience, excuse me, reputation, service, faith and trust in God, um, and some scriptures to back that up. The question we need to ask ourselves through this is, do I trust this person to do the work of an elder? No person certainly meets these qualifications perfectly, but we must uh, judge whether a person meets the qualifications sufficiently. Uh, two weeks ago, we talked about uh, this list of qualifications from the book of 1 Timothy, verse, chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. So I encourage you to turn in your Bibles there, 1 Timothy, chapter 3, and we'll do some more reading there. We went through the, the list uh, presented there, and here are some alternatives, uh, uh, definitions from different translations, someone who aspires to the work of an elder who's above reproach, husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, 
able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, or, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, manages their household well, not a recent convert, and well thought of. So this morning, we'll move on to, uh, to verses 8 through 13. Now, these verses, as you'll see, uh, talk about uh, deacons and their wives. And I make the assumption that not only should elders meet the qualifications specifically listed for them in the verses we read ahead, but I believe they should uh, meet the qualifications listed for deacons and also the qualifications listed for the wives of deacons. And I'll talk some more about that rationale a little later, but I don't see any characteristic in this description that does not, would not apply to elders. And so here is the, the list that we'll read here in a moment, starting in chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. So follow along with me if you would. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So let's uh, go through those uh, qualifications briefly. Uh, dignified, other translations say respectful or worthy of respect, not double-tongued, not addicted, not fond of much wine, another translation says not greedy, they don't pursue dishonest gain, they don't go after sordid gain, hold the mystery of the faith, they must first be tested, another translation says they must first be proved, uh, husband of one wife, managing their house, ruling their house, uh, found unimpeachable, another one says. Wives are to be dignified, same thing here, respectful, worthy of respect, not slanderers, not malicious gossips, sober-minded, self-controlled, temperate, faithful in all things, dependable, and trustworthy are the characteristics of uh, deacons and their wives. So next, uh, the next uh, scripture in our list is in Titus. And we'll see what Titus has written compared to what's written in Timothy. Uh, one of, I think, an important rule of Bible study and understanding the Bible is the Bible interprets itself. And so uh, it's always helpful to take into account the whole context of the Scripture in uh, making, making judgments and determinations based on what God's will is for us. So we'll turn to the book of uh, Titus. And look at, uh, in chapter 1, look at verses 5 through 11. Here Paul says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above approach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, or a drunkard or violent or greedy to gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, undisciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced, since they are upsetting whole families, by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach." So if we compare, then, the, uh, the, the list in Titus to what we have in 1 Timothy, we find a lot of overlap. Now, uh, when you were young and your parents really wanted you to do something or really wanted you to remember something, what did they do? They repeated it, right? And so when we see things in the Bible more than once, that's God telling us this is more important. This is something you should pay attention to, okay? So we see a lot of things repeated here. Uh, we see the idea of above reproach. The husband of one wife is repeated again, the idea of being self-controlled. Uh, hospitable is repeated. 
able to teach. Titus says able to give instruction. Uh, not a drunkard is mentioned in Titus. Uh, not uh, violent, but gentle. And not a lover of money. So you can see that uh, uh, both of them put an emphasis on, uh, on money. And uh, some people even speculate that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, right? We also see, though, that in the list of things for deacons, uh, the idea of holding firm the faith, holding the mystery of the faith, was also listed in the list of, uh, of qualifications for deacons. So he gives the elders a qualification in Titus, then he only lists the deacons in First, in first Timothy. So was Paul confused? Or uh, I don't think so. Paul seems to think that at least one of the qualities of deacons should also apply to elders. We do have some things in Titus, though, that are unique that are not mentioned in First Timothy. Uh, the idea that uh, children are believers. Uh, a uh, elder is not to be arrogant. He's to be a lover of good. He's to be upright, holy, and disciplined. And these specific terms are not used in First Timothy, but we can see that they all fit within uh, the principles that are taught in First Timothy. So our next verse we'll look at is in First Peter, uh, chapter five, verses one to three. So if you want to turn there, we'll see how it compares with what was written in Timothy and uh, again see the Bible interprets itself. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Um, if we look at how Peter overlaps with, uh, with these other qualifications, we'll see there's really not much overlap here. He talks about the idea of, of aspiring to, which uh, the idea of doing it weir- willingly or eagerly, Um, The other thing he mentions again, mentioned in all four of these, is the idea of uh, freedom from greed or the love of money. The work of an elder is not done uh, uh, effectively if it's uh, 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 colored with the idea of making money. A couple things unique to 1 Peter is the idea of not being domineering and serving as examples. Uh, those characteristics are not listed in those other lists. Let's move on to, uh, to one more, and that's in the book of James, chapter 3. So turn in your Bibles there, if you would, and we'll go through a few verses there. Now, in, in James, chapter 3, uh, James begins in verse 1 to talk about the accountability of teachers. He says, uh, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Uh, We've read before that every elder, every pastor, every shepherd is to be a teacher. So I believe that chapter 3 is clearly applicable to elders and bishops in their role as teachers. Uh, Later in chapter 3, James talks about the wisdom that should be characteristic of all Christians, but perhaps especially of teachers, which would include elders, of course. Uh, Beginning in in verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Uh, By his good conduct, let him show his works in meekness of wisdom. He more explicitly defines the wisdom that a pastor teachers should have in verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Okay. So now if we add uh, a column for James... We'll see that uh, there are two characteristics he mentions, the idea of being gentle, 
the idea of not being quarrelsome or contentious is in the list of James. Uh, he too mentions an issue of that's that's uh, listed in First um, Timothy for deacons: the idea of being sincere. Some qualities that are unique to James. Other people haven't mentioned this directly, but maybe implied, of course, in First Timothy and Titus, is the idea that this should be a person who's known for good conduct. Uh, a teacher should be a person who has. Uh, wisdom, but meekness that comes from wisdom. Sometimes the smarter you are, you understand the less you know, right? There is a meekness that comes from wisdom. Uh, the idea of being pure, the idea of being open to reason is not something listened in the, listed in the other scriptures, but certainly is complementary of those characteristics. And the idea of being full of mercy. And finally, the idea of being impartial. But let's look at one scripture that isn't in our list, and that's in Matthew chapter 20. Let's look at verses 25 through 28. So turn there in your copy of the scriptures, if you would. And let's read that. Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28. But Jesus called to them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall... It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so we'd have to ask, does this scripture have anything to do with the qualifications of elders? And you might guess that since I put it in here, I would say the answer is yes. And... Um, let me tell you a little bit about why I think Matthew chapter 20 links to elder qualifications. And I want to put a quote up here from uh, uh, who I think is, is, is a well-known Christian. And it's this quote, All Christians should have a servant heart, and the ultimate servant is an elder. Okay. So just to test here, if this person is well-known, how many of you know this guy named Art Clark? Okay, well, I was right. See, he is well-known, all right? But this idea that, that a servant heart is essential to, to eldership, I think, is a critical one. Jesus talks about the rulers of the Gentiles behave in a certain way, but it's not to be so with you. So let's summarize all of our qualifications that we've seen so far. The idea of aspiring to and desiring, the idea of being above approach, of being a one-woman man, Sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, manages their household well, not a novice, well thought of, dignified, not double-tongued, hold the mystery of the faith closely, first be tested, not slanderous, faithful in all things. These are all things from 1 Timothy. In Titus, we add, children are believers, not arrogant, lover of good, upright, holy, disciplined. That comes from Titus. From James, we get the idea of uh, uh, both elders and teachers should have good reputations for good conduct, should have a meekness of wisdom to them, should be pure, should be open to reason, full of mercy, impartial. Peter adds, not domineering, and as examples. So one purpose in doing all this is to view in one place most of the leadership qualities described in the New Testament. I think it also helps us understand the overlaps and the interrelatedness of all of these scriptures. And I think they all fit together with the idea of, does the person have a servant heart and wish to serve others? Um, we also, I think, see that a checklist approach won't work, where uh, uh, we, we have to say... Um, you know, it's, it's a long list, and it talks primarily about what I'd call subjective things. So ask, ask, asking God for wisdom, we must subjectively determine whether men sub substantially, but not perfectly, conform to the qualities listed. And once again, do we trust this man to do the work of an elder based on the godly leadership principles found in Scripture? Um, this is a quote from Brother J.B. Myers that I think is a good one. 
uh, although elders cannot be perfect at all times in the way they conduct themselves, there should be a consensus agreement by the church that the elders represent a good example of Christian character. The qualifications given to Timothy and Titus assist us in making this judgment, however. Even without these qualifications, we can determine from the rest of the scriptures the kind of character a faithful Christian should have. Both elders and the church are called to godly living, and the elders should lead the church excuse me, in the pursuit of holiness. So we talk about the idea of objective versus subjective and facts versus judgment. Um, you know, it's a fact that today is Sunday. And most kids, probably from age five and up, when you ask them what day of the week it is, they can tell you. And there's never a debate, there's never a discussion about, well, maybe it isn't Sunday, maybe it's Monday, maybe it's Thursday. It's a fact that today is Sunday. So uh, from a very young age, a person can determine facts. But the idea of a subjective judgment is more uh, difficult. Now, job qualifications can include both objective and subjective criteria. So you, know, you may read a, read a, a job qualification that will say, uh, you know, this person needs to have a bachelor's degree. Or more important, okay, we're, 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 hiring, we're hiring a nurse, and they need to have a registered nursing license. Now, it doesn't matter what kind of experience they have. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of education they've had. If they don't have a registered nursing license, they cannot be qualified for that job as a nurse, right? So that's just a fact. And, and even an eight-year-old can look at that and say, well, this person has a license, that person doesn't, this person's automatically disqualified. And so I guess the question is, as we look at this list of things, are there any things that are solely based on facts with which we can um, immediately disregard a candidate? Uh, objective things are measurable, they are factual, they are quantifiable. They have a similar meaning to different people. Everyone agrees today Sunday. We're all different here. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have uh, lots of differences among us. But even though we're all so different, we all agree today is Sunday. Now, if I were to ask a judgment question, do you like Monday better than Tuesday? Well, that's a subjective judgment, right? Some of you would raise your hand for Monday, and some of you would raise your hand for Tuesday, maybe. And somebody says, well, really, I like Thursday best. And a bunch of you would say, you know, Saturday's my favorite day, right? And uh, somebody who has to work on Saturday would say, well, that's not really my favorite day. We all have, we all have different meanings. Now, sub objective things would be degrees, certifications, specific achievements. Subjective things are harder to measure. Uh, they are determined primarily by the perception of each individual using their judgment. And different people have different opinions, feelings, and values. But I think one reason why these leadership qualities are spread through Scripture is so that we can all kind of start to get a similar understanding of what God's view of these uh, uh, qualifications are. But then we're still left with the subjective judgment of, does this person being considered for the role of an elder or deacon or whatever, do they substantiate, in, in my opinion, in my subjective judgment, do they meet that? Okay. So when we look at this list, we say, well, is the criteria objective or subjective? You know, could a seven or eight-year-old say, okay, I can, which of these can I measure? Which of these can I determine, even though I'm young and don't have much uh, uh, judgment or perception or experience, is there something here that I can just look at and immediately know whether or not it, uh, it is true or not? Uh, now, of course, almost all of these are clearly subjective. They reflect attitudes difficult to measure objectively. We cannot measure the degree of aspiration or desire. We cannot say this person has desire of 9 out of 10 and this person has desire of 7 out of 10. We can't measure it that way, can we? Um, most of these require, clearly require the use of godly judgment. They require experience to analyze and interpret. If we were to ask our elementary kids to rate people in the congregation according to this criteria, how good a job do you think they would do? Well, I would argue they're probably not going to do such a good job. 
Why? Because they lack the majority, maturity to accurately discern such qualities. So if we were to ask an eight-year-old, okay, does, is this person greedy for money or not? Is this person, do they hold the mystery of the faith closely or not? An eight-year-old is going to go, I don't know, you know, and I, and I can't really make that judgment, okay? There are a couple of criteria, however, that could be taken as very objective, very measurable, and not subject to opinion. However, what I'd warn you is that if every other criteria on this list is subjective, we need to be very careful if we say that some are clearly objective and measurable in a way that everyone, even an eight-year-old, can determine. Uh, these two qualifications generate a lot of debate in the Lord's Church today, mostly because someone tries to come up with a hard and fast rule. And I would argue that that is not what is intended by these two criteria. And as you may know, one of those is that children are believers, and the other one is uh, a one-woman man, or uh, some translations say the husband of one wife. So let's look at these two things and see what... Uh, what the, uh, the Holy Spirit may be trying to tell us with these two criteria. Uh, so uh, the idea of a one-woman man or a man of one woman, what does it mean? Does it exclude a never married man? Does it exclude a divorced unmarried man? Does it exclude a divorced man who has remarried? Does it exclude a widowed man who is unmarried? Does it exclude a widowed man who is remarried? He's the husband of one wife. Well, you know, he's had two, even if as a widow, widower has remarried. Does it exclude a polygamous man? Does it exclude an unfaithful married man? Does it exclude a flirtatious married man? In one woman man, did the Holy Spirit intend to give us a specific objective criteria or just a general attitude or a principle? something Brother Myers wrote. In the past, I thought the point being made by this qualification related mostly to polygamy or marriage and divorce. I've since revised my thinking. I now believe that the main point of this qualification concerns the faithfulness of the husband to his wife. Does the man have a reputation of being a faithful husband, and does he abstain from sexual immorality? Give you some more background on that. So let's review, first of all, the, uh, the position in the list. Uh, once again, when you were young and your parents wanted you to remember something, they usually mentioned, what, the most important thing first, right? Okay? And, and you know, God is no different in dealing with his children. So we have this criteria, the idea of being a one-woman man, or some translations say the husband of one wife. It is listed after aspiration, is listed as the third criteria, or, you know, the second in the list of above reproach in Timothy. This criteria does appear in both 1 Timothy and Titus, and, both, and in both the phrase is listed second after above reproach or blameless. So here we, it's something obviously that's very important to God. It's in the second place in both the list in Timothy and the list in Titus, Okay. Uh, I think then it is also emphasized again in Timothy when talking about the qualifications of deacons. So I think its second place position and it's mentioned in three places implies it is very important and that its meaning is deep and goes well beyond a simple objective measure that even an eight-year-old could interpret. Also note that none of the qualifications in either Timothy or Titus relate to sexual immorality. I'm skeptical that Paul overlooked this important characteristic. I'm more comfortable saying we overlook the general principle of sexual purity when we give the phrase one woman man a very specific meaning. One of the most powerful determinants of what a word means, of course, is its context. What the other words around it are saying. The other words are subjective, qualitative criteria, so I lean towards saying that one woman man is subjective and qualitative as well. Another principle of understanding words is to look at where they are used elsewhere in Scripture. Now, unfortunately, this exact phrase appears nowhere else outside of 1 Timothy. However, there is a very similar, similar phrase used elsewhere in 1 Timothy that is very instructive. So 
So while the idea of a one-woman man is not used anywhere else in the New Testament, the concept of a, of, of a one-man woman is used in 1 Timothy. And that's in chapter 5 that we'll read here. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she's over 60, has been faithful to her husband. Or other translations would say she's been the wife, the, 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 the wife of one husband. Although the actual phrase is in Greek is she's a one-man one woman, which is the opposite of what we read earlier uh, of a one-woman man. Okay? The NIV translated faithful to her husband, which, of course, I put it up here because I agree with that. And it is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of saints, helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also gossips and busybodies saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. So as we think about this, Paul requires that a widow to be supported by the church must be a one-man woman. This is identical construction to what is listed in the qualifications of elders and deacons, except, of course, there it says a one-woman man. So when we think about one man, woman, uh, did the Holy Spirit mean that to be only women who had married only one time? Or could it apply to women who had been married to more than one man, but only one at a time? In verse 14, Paul encourages younger widows to remarry, but he does not mention that a downside of this is that they would no longer qualify for congregational benevolence when their second husband dies. So I think the NIV translation of one man, woman makes more sense, that she was faithful to one husband at a time. Let's say a woman is widowed young and then remarried at age 27 to another man for 30 years. Why should this woman be excluded from help versus the single woman who married only once at age 27? Why would God require such an arbitrary objective criteria for help from the church? What principle would support such an interpretation? And I would argue there is none. Most translations go with only one husband approach and do not follow what I think is the more likely meaning as translated in the NIV and a few others, the idea of been faithful to her husband, been a one-man woman dedicated to one woman at a time. So this idea of a one-man woman as an elder qualification. To me, the most reasonable way to understand it is that it refers to a man's faithfulness to his wife and avoidance of sexual immorality. I think this makes best sense of the expression one-woman man that is found in Greek. It makes the criteria subjective rather than quantitative requiring judgment to apply, just like all the others. It explains why sexual purity was omitted from the list, because it is, in fact, already included in this qualification. I think it connects better with the preceding qualification above reproach and blameless. Uh, the idea that this refers to faithfulness to his wife best explains its high priority in two different lists. It implies that a remarried widower can qualify to be an elder, which is consistent with other pr biblical principles of leadership. And it is more consistent with the practical and reasonable criteria given for selecting widows to be cared for by the church. So let's talk about this. If, if, if the phrase, he's the husband of one wife, cannot be taken literally and specifically and objectively, then what is the implications of that? Well, your, your first implication is, okay, well, what about the widowed elder? He is no longer the husband of any wife, right? And I would say that even if the widowed are not disqualified by the one-woman man phrase, they still face some difficulties in remaining as elders. God places wives as helpmeets to complement a man's strengths and weaknesses. Timothy gives qualifications for the wives of leaders, 
Without this support, a man would likely find the challenges of, of eldership difficult to bear alone. Now, uh, I'll, I'll test a little bit your age here. How many of you have heard of Red Skelton? Okay, well, most of you have heard of Red Skelton. All right. Uh, but for those of you who haven't, he was a comedian back when I was young, so a long, long time ago, back in horse and buggy days. But anyway, to paraphrase a quote I heard from Red, all people make mistakes, married people just find out about them sooner. All right? Who better to quickly call you on your mistakes than the spouse who loves you? I believe an elder needs to know when they've made a mistake more than anyone else in the congregation because their mistakes have such a broad impact. And uh, having a spouse who can call you on your mistakes is critical to, I think, serving effectively as an elder and a leader in the congregation. The challenge with divorce. So what about the issue of, okay, uh, a man who uh, is, is the husband of one wife, if that means, uh, really, if that means just he is, uh, uh, lives a, uh, uh, a sexually uh, pure life, what about the person who's divorced? Well, even if the previously divorced but now remarried are not strictly disqualified by the one-woman-man phrase, they must still be blameless and above reproach. Uh, selecting a divorce man would require the congregation to understand the basis of the divorce and judge whether it occurred for scriptural reasons. In many cases, I would argue this is impractical and often controversial to delve into this type of history of, of this person. And so, therefore, we have avoided it at Linda Road and said that we will not appoint to anyone in leadership who has previously been divorced. Uh, now, of course, men otherwise qualified can serve in other important ways, even if they have this uh, event in their history. Are never married men allowed to be elders? In my opinion, no. If one woman man emphasizes sexual purity, then godly single men could certainly meet that qualification. But, Single men would still fail to meet the qualification of guiding their own household, um, and I believe that this is important experience to be effective in being an overall leader in God's community. Timothy, in Timothy, Paul says, if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he care for the church of God? If, or stated another way, if a person has not had his own house to rule, how will he learn to rule the house of God? <clears throat> So is the criteria based on facts or judgment? <clears throat> Almost all these qualifications are, without a doubt, subjective. They cannot be explicitly measured or quantified and cannot be determined only by using one's judgment based on life experience and the study of God's principles. I mentioned that one woman man is, in my opinion, asking us to make a judgment of the individual's morality with regard to sexual matters and is not a strictly objective measure of being married only once. There is also another qualification that's sometimes interpreted as strictly objective or factual, and that is that whose children are believers. So let's explore this one a little bit more. So having faithful children in Titus 1.6, what does it mean? It's also listed as a qualification of deacons in uh, uh, Timothy. Uh, at least one child, does it mean at least one child or offspring? Does it mean at least two children, plural, whose children are believers? Uh, does it mean that all the children are faithful or only some? Does it mean that the children are faithful in the sense that they are trustworthy and reliable, but not necessarily believing children? Does it apply to children even after they leave home? In faithful children, did the Holy Spirit intend to give us a specific, objective, measurable criteria or just a general attitude or a principle? In 1 Corinthians 7.14, when Paul uses children, does it mean uh, at least one or at least two? And of course, when he's talking about your children, he's using the plural is the same as the singular. 
There's no indication from the context that plurality is necessary. Uh, for the last time, don't let the dogs in the house or you'll be punished. So if it just let one dog in the house, that'll be okay. But if I let the dogs in the house, then I'll be punished. And of course, any parent would say, no, one dog, you're going to get a spanking. Or you're going to get sent to timeout, right? If you say, don't let the dogs in the house. If you let just one dog, uh, the, the, the plural covers the singular. And that's what I think is happening here. Now, dealing with the other three questions, or what, other four questions, is more complex, a lot less certainty, and more room for different conclusions among the brethren. So faithful children, I think some judgment and common sense are an objective measure is at least one child who's obeyed the gospel, but the challenge to that is, of course, did they obey from the heart or only to please their parents? Another observation is a perfect environment will not guarantee that children will remain faithful after they leave their father's house. How do we know that? How about people with a couple of people with microphones that can bring them to you if you want to answer? A perfect environment will not guarantee that children will remain faithful after they leave their father's house. How do we know that? Okay, Mike, here our microphone guy is coming. Adam and Eve. And why Adam and Eve? They had everything perfect and they still blew it. Okay. So they had the perfect father, the perfect instruction, perfect example, and they still chose to do something else. All right. Now, Mike did not look at my notes, but I think he does read out of the same book that I do and came to the same conclusion that I did, that God was the perfect father and his first human children chose to rebel. Hey, Daryl has a comment. Larry, um, I read in, I believe, second or third John about a man that would not qualify to be an elder. His name. But uh, Diotrephes, or? Diotrephes, I believe. Right. Yeah. Uh, he would kick people out of the church because he didn't like them. Yeah. So he, he doesn't need to read the qualifications. Right. Yep. And, we, and we'll talk some more about that exact example. Uh, I guess it's going to be next week, not this, but, but that's a, a good point that you raise about diatrophies. Okay. Um, we could ask, though, what if all of a man's children quickly abandon the faith as soon as they leave home? Ephesians 6 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. Okay. And we'll conclude with this slide about the idea of uh, elder meaning older. One gains experience for shepherding the church by first shepherding his family, including his children. This requires some time on the job at home before he's ready for the job in the local community of Christians. Now, my opinion here, determining whether children are faithful, trustworthy, or reliable is best done when they have the freedom to make their own choices. Uh, the scripture says that leaders should not be a novice in the faith, and I don't believe they should be a novice at home. Maybe I have time for one more. So my application of faithful children, managing your own family well, and also then the idea of elder. How old is old enough to be an elder? So my practical rule of thumb is a man is old enough to be considered an elder, has enough experience managing his household to shepherd the local assembly, has demonstrated leadership with his children, has sufficient time to devote to the church without neglecting his family, when he has what? When he has raised a child through their teens. So that's kind of the guideline, the practical rule of thumb that I use to say is what's old enough to be an elder, what's old enough to have uh, had sufficient experience at home to uh, shepherd the church of God. It's a person who successfully raised a child through their teens. So, uh, and I'm saved by the bell. Thanks for your uh, attention and attendance this morning.